So managerial economics, this is uh, week number five, correct? Yeah. Week number five. Uh, this means that uh, this is lecture 13. And now I'm switching to the new edition, right? The new edition, which is uh, edition, what is it? Ninth edition of this textbook. And well, let's kind of have it. Is it zooming in nicely? Yeah. All right. You got it from here? Hmm? You got it from here? No, 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 I didn't get it from, uh, from here. I got it it's from the, the publisher. Same, right? I got it from the publisher. It's the same one. All right, so uh, now I am to chapter three. Chapter three. So let's do now chapter three. It is called optimization, but optimization, everybody understands it's math. So in MBA, we can't deliver math, we got to deliver business, so we call it optimal decision making or just optimal decisions. Optimal decisions. And for optimal decisions, we use one major primary tool in economics, this is the primary analytical tool for microeconomics as well as macroeconomics and we call it marginal marginal analysis marginal analysis is very easy very intuitive but extremely hard for engineers and physicists because it represents different type of thinking all right so, what do we have here? Well, what is, first of all, optimal decisions and marginal analysis? It is about two basic things in economics. Not demand and supply, but benefits and costs. So, you have costs, and costs, remember from probably the first lecture, is something or resource of value which you must sacrifice in order to obtain something else. Well, whatever you obtain, you get some benefit. So, costs and benefits. Alright. Out of these two, we get the next natural logical concept and the concept is that of joining these two together net benefit net net benefit net benefit is simply is defined as benefit minus costs benefit minus costs. Now, for businesses and for corporations, net benefit has very special name and we call it net profit. Profit. Just profit. Just profit. In this particular case, I'm coming back as a reminder from lecture one that what we're concerned is economic. economic profit. So we would rather have these as economic profits and not as accounting uh, profits. Set up clear so far? All right, let's see now marginal analysis. All right, so. We are now moving, or at least I'm moving, to section three one. In section three one is concepts and what else? Terminology. Alright. Are you zooming in nicely? It's clear. Alright. So zoom in like this, all right? So it's real big because then it budges. All right, so which is the first very important concept? Well, let me take a look. Let me take a look. 
Number one is, the first concept is objective, objective function. This is simply the function or the mathematical value, not value. In value we mean the benefit that we get. In this particular case it is the mathematical value of a function which we try to optimize. So, optimize. To optimize me, oops, to try to obtain the optimal value of something, the optimal value of a function. Optimal has dual meaning. In some cases, optimal means maximum, and in other cases, optimal means minimum. In other words, based on common sense, simple logic of what humans intuitively understand, you either try to maximize or try to minimize. minimize. Uh, women understand this concept well when they go to the store and try to do their sh weekly shopping. And in that particular case, you try to minimize the overall cost of your shopping, right? On the other hand, you try to maximize the quantity of food that you're trying to get. In other words, based on what you're trying to optimize, it will be either a maximum, so for act, optimize becomes maximize, or it will be a minimum to minimize. So, in order to avoid saying maximize, 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 because sometimes we will try to minimize costs or minimize spending, but other times we're just, we can't just say minimize, minimize, minimize because we're trying to maximize. We use the generic term optimize, which means either maximize or minimize depending on the particular circumstances, all right? So, from optimize, we get the next little thing, which is optimal solution. This is an elementary mathematical concept, it is when you're doing something, like you're shopping, you're trying to get a certain amount of food for one week, the optimal solution will include two things, and I'm getting now to both of them at the same time. The first one is that of activity. Activity is the variable over which we have particular control, and which we determine or which we can choose over in order to either maximize or minimize something. For a business, for a business, for example, the variable may be quantity of units produced. All right? That's the activity variable. Of course, you will try to maximize profits or maximize revenues. Of course, the quantity may possibly affect the price. But overall, the activity is the same as, usually in mathematics is called choice, choice variable. Choice variable, okay? This is something that you have a control over and that you choose so as to maximize something else. That something else is the objective function, okay? Usually the objective function is in the form on the mathematically on the left. So the objective function will be if it's a 
function of one variable, y is a function of the variable x. So y is the objective function and x will represent the choice variable. The choice variable has been, for the most part in this chapter and for the rest of the textbook, simply called activity. All right? So, you choose the variable that you choose and it will maximize, or well, let's call it optimize, the function, the objective function. Okay? And now the op op optimal solution will be represented by usually the pair of choice variables so choice variables and then in other words the value of choice variables and then the objective function objective function all right so the solution represents the value of the variables that we choose together with the value of the function, the objective function. For example, we produce optimally, turns out to produce 500 cars and the profit or revenue for 500 cars will be by $20,000, what is it, $1 million. Alright, uh, choice variable for our program is number of students to enroll in an MBA program to the extent that uh, we're not constricted by the market, meaning we have only two students that are applying. In other words, we can choose 10, 20, 30, or 40. It does not necessarily mean that choosing more students is always better, okay? It's certainly not necessary. And the objective function will be some revenue number, some revenue that the university will try to get out of students and possibly make some profit out of it. Of course, in the early years of an MBA program, usually the university makes little or no money. What the university earns are, are not profits, but reputation. Reputation, perfect, bonus point, exactly correct. Repeat, someone's done marketing? <laughs> yes. All right, so you see, someone's done marketing. You see how the senior students are, you know, shining bright. Yes, reputation. In other words, sometimes the objective function is probably a combination of profitability plus reputation. And early on in the process, it is very possible, actually, perfectly realistic here at PSU, that the university will sacrifice profitability in order to gain reputation on the market. Of course, the sacrifice of profitability simply means that with the higher reputation, the university will be able to more than compensate with future profits the lost early profits. All right? It just makes perfect business sense. And this is exactly how businessmen operate in the early stages of developing a business. Any business, whether it's cars or anything else. Alright, does this make sense? Alright, let's see what else we have. Alright, so the overall subject, the overall subject that we are doing right now, which I should have probably started with is simply called optimization. Optimization is simply the subject or the branch of mathematics which deals with proper techniques to optimize specific functions. All right. Let's see what else. Uh, so, activities, choice variables, yes. So, now, choice variables, activities and choice variables can fall or can be classified largely in two broad categories. 
which fall within the realm of mathematics. The first is called discrete, and the second one is called continuous. Crude oil and crude oil production, continuous or discrete? The oil itself is continuous. It sure flows. You can just get as much as you want, you know, from one hundredth of a liter to one millionth of a liter to half a liter to 1.3 liters or gallons or whatever. But if you are using for crude oil barrels, barrels are and must be necessarily discrete. Not because it's related to oil. This is the nature of a barrel. You get either one barrel or two barrels. You can't just kind of like get a barrel and a half. It doesn't, it's not logical. It doesn't make sense. Another example of a discrete variable will be cars. You buy two cars or three cars. It just doesn't make sense to have a car and a half or 7.3 cars. I mean, what does it mean, 0.3 cars? All right, it's got no logical, it has no common sense meaning. In other words, even though there is some mathematics behind it, otherwise it is perfectly logical, makes common sense. A uh, very nice continuous variable is rice or wheat or all of those variables we can just, you know, cut and slice and dice. Uh, horses, you can't, you know, uh, let's say uh, uh, racing horses, you know, a racing horse, right? Mm -hmm. Very popular here in the Arab world. You can't just have 1.3 racing horses. You have either one or two. You know, a leg of a racing horse is worth nothing. Just a piece of meat, right? Which we usually don't eat and isn't worth much or anything, right? So again, the nature is that of a discrete. So what does it mean, discrete? Discrete mathematically means that it usually is one of the so-called whole numbers. One, two, three, four. In other words, it is a, in mathematics, how do we call Integ these? Integer. Integer, integer numbers. So it is an integer number, yes. Uh, let's write it out. In integer. But uh, sometimes uh, we like to call it natural. So what is the difference between integer and natural numbers in math? Okay, so with naturals you have no minus, meaning natural numbers are non-negative integers. All right, so a lot of times in the real business world we deal with natural numbers. Somehow, you know, you can't just work with minus three cars. It just doesn't make logical sense, all right? Just work with two, three, zero cars. So natural means non-negative, zero, one, two, and so forth. So ideally, I should have appropriately started out with Zero. Of course, sometimes in investments you may work with negative numbers, like you're shorting a stock. If you short 300 shares of IBM, the natural mathematical representation of shorting is that of negative. So you actually own minus 300 shares. To own minus 300 simply means that you actually owe 300 shares, right? All right. So. There are possibilities, but in the real world, most of the times you deal with naturals. All right, continuous simply means that it can take any value on the real line. All right, oil, rice, water, everything else. Now, once you move to bottles of water, you're naturally in the world of discrete numbers, right? Just like barrels, just like cars. All right, fairly clear? All right, let's see what's next, next, next is that of optimization
is essentially, for what we're trying to do here, uh, the attempt or the process by which we find the optimal solution. So, optimization is the process. You go through particular steps. So, optimization in general has two very important branches. The first one is called unconstrained and the second one is constrained. Unconstrained optimization means that the choice variable or the activity could be any possible value, any even real value, sometimes any positive value. So you're a manager and you can choose, for example, one barrel of oil or hundred or a thousand or a million or five million or ten million. You choose whatever you like to choose. Constrained means that you have particular restrictions on the choice variable. One example of constraint optimization is you simply have a factory producing cars and you could produce either Toyota Corollas or Toyota Camrys or Toyota Yaris and you basically can produce even if you work it 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, you can only produce, no matter what you try, only 1,000 cars per week. That's it. This is the capacity. So, the optimization will be, do we produce 1,000 Corollas or do we produce 1,000 cameras? Or do we split 500 to 500, all right? Again, we are trying to optimize some costs, some revenues and ultimately the profitability, meaning the profit. So it may turn out that the profit will give you an interim solution. It may just as well be that the most profitable solution will be one-third of Yaris, one-third of Corolla, one-third of Camry. That's one type of constraint. Just an example. So, sorry, it's not one type. It's one example, just illustration. A different type of illustration of constraint will be our MBA program. We have only four rooms. We can have only, at most, and at best, only four classes running at the same time. And of course, the rooms have, you look around yourself, what, 22 <coughs> chairs? Of course, we can slide in the third, 23rd, and 24th chair, but overall, the capacity is 100. All right. 100. That's it. All right, so the constraint optimization is we can handle only 100 students. That's just because this is the capacity that we have, and that's the end of the story, all right? Otherwise, we have to be solving a completely different problem. We call it capital budgeting problem if it is worth investing in two or four <coughs> classrooms, all right? So that we can expand well beyond 100, all right? So that's yet a second example, just an illustration of a constraint optimization problem. So within those 100, we have to figure out how many students, what to charge, etc., etc., etc. A third type of an, exa of an example of a constraint optimization is a <coughs> car dealer. A car dealer can properly get, let's say, one million dollar loan for, let's say, three months or six, six months, and he will use this loan to carry cars in his parking lot. We call this, in business, in accounting? Inventory. Inventory. No inventory. Sorry. Inventory. All right? Inventory. That's American English, all right? Okay. Inventory. So, inventory is, you know, he has one million. He can choose to have Ford Mustangs, or he can choose to have Ford Victoria Crowns, right? These are the big ones here. He can just choose some other cars, you know, Chevy Cavalier. In other words, he has one million, and we call this type of constraint a 
a very special type in business, we call it budget constraint. So, the very special type which we use is called budget constraint. Alright, now, uh, I don't want to insult your intelligence, but constrained, here comes out of the word constrain and is an adjective. So we call it constrained optimization. Here, budget is adjective and constraint is no. noun. Alright, so constraint is the noun out of the verb constrain. Alright, so budget constraint. Usually, budget constraint is a constraint which is based on the total amount of dollars that could be spent. So, the budget constraint usually has the type B, which stands short for budget, and will have quantity 1 times the cost of good 1 plus quantity 2 times the cost of good 2. Let's call it good is not good name. Resource 2, right? It could be labor, number of professors. It could be number of, you know, the price of cucumbers or it could be the price of cars. Plus dot 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 plus Q and the cost of the nth resource. Now just a little refresher for myself is we usually denote this as a sum and the sum is Q times C and it is QI we call it Q sub I C sub I sub standing for subscript and the subscript now I'm deleting this is I beginning from 1 and going all the way to small n. Alright? So usually this is almost always, almost always in the real world a limiting. In other words, when we say constraint, we mean limiting. Means there is a natural limit. What's the natural limit? Hey, you're a small dealer. You got one parking lot and you got 25 cars. You can't expect the bank to give you 10 million or 20 million or 50 million to carry your inventory. He'll say, hey, you got 25 cars. The average price or value of a car is $25,000. We can give you at best half a million. That's it. All right? So they say, well, but I'm carrying Porsches and BMW. You say, okay, naturally we can extend it all the way to a minute. Show us you're buying Porsches and BMs, right? And that's it. But you can't just expect to be unconstrained, you know, walk into the bank, say, hey, give me five, give me 20, give me 50 million, right? So this is the next natural concept. Let's see a few more uh, concepts. All right, actually the next big one is that of marginal analysis. Uh -oh. Marginal. All right, so marginal analysis is analysis which is based on the margin. So what does margin mean in economics? It simply means one more item, one more piece, increasing the quantity with one more unit, increasing the quantity with one more unit. Its margin is simply means the next unit. From there comes marginal which means related to the next or related to the last unit. Alright? So, in our particular case as an MBA program, 
we are having some extra costs. In other words, marginal is the same as extra. Is the relative marginal cost of one MBA student high or relatively low? The cost. High. high. Why would it be high? What's costing us, the university? Uh, well, the answer is unfortunately low. low. Extremely low. The next MBA student is dirt cheap. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's clarify. <laughs> I, I, I'm playing with the English language. What does it mean? It means we now already have, what is it, 25 students this year and maybe 20 students next year. Suppose we hire one more student. What is it going to cost us? Nothing. Nothing. That's correct. It will not cost us a new building, it will not cost us a new room, it will not cost us a new chair, it will not cost us a new professor. So, the cost will be associated maybe 20-30 minutes more administrative time for the administrator who will accept, enroll and you know, uh, serve the student. It will cost some photocopying. Maybe they'll have to give him a nice little booklet and bulletin and whatnot, give him some instruction, all those things. So, nothing in the sense means the cost is minimal, the cost is symbolic. So, from the cost point of view, the next student doesn't cost much, meaning costs very little. This is also the reason, now jumping many chapters ahead in the textbook, this is also the reason why a lot of universities have those promotions and provide for those, uh, you know, scholarship, right? It costs $10,000, but if you enroll, we're going to give you a $5,000 scholarship. You're going to pay us only $5,000. Again, scholarships typically apply only to the marginal students. This is getting one extra student, but the extra student, for whatever reasons, would not want to pay the full 10000 tuition. So, you get him to pay 5000 That's because if the program is not full, if the program is not at capacity, adding one extra student overall will increase the cost minimally. It may cost maybe $100 for the full year, maybe $200, all right? So it's almost the same thing. So this is an application of the concept of marginal cost. Well, what is the marginal revenue? So on the margin in economics, we talk about marginal cost and marginal, uh, let's call it Profit. revenue and for the most part in economics revenue is the same as as I started early on, benefit so what is the marginal revenue? With a $5,000 scholarship, the revenue is still $5,000 because the full price is $10,000. I'm just picking random numbers. And what will be the net benefit or the net in this particular case becomes marginal benefit, the net, the net marginal benefit. So we don't call it marginal net benefit. All right? Mm -hmm. We call it net marginal benefit will be if the overall cost for everything is let's say $500 then the overall net benefit, net marginal benefit will be $4,500 if we give the student a uh, scholarship. scholarship or whatever. All right, so marginal analysis in economics is economic analysis of costs and benefits.
based on the marginal unit, which in turn is based on the marginal cost and marginal benefit of that last unit or of that marginal unit. This is the main analysis which is used in economics and represents the main tool to find optimal solutions. The other main tool in economics is supply and demand. Is this good enough for a break? Yes. Alright, so we are done with this lecture. Let's hit the pause button.